Good morning. Welcome as we gather to worship and to celebrate God's love, God's grace in our lives and in this world. Also want to welcome those who are joining us by video. We hope you will experience God's grace in meaningful ways as you worship with us. Uh, in your bulletin, there's little slips of paper. If you would please include your name with contact information. If we need to get hold of you later, we're able to do that. Also, they are a part of my uh, prayer each week. And so if there's prayer requests, you can put that on the back side. If it's just for me, uh, just write private, and then I'll be the only one that gets it. Also, following our worship service, we will be having fellowship. It's in the next building out through this door. We hope you'll plan to stay. The uh, Christian Ed and the choir have put together well, quite a feast, and so we don't want to miss that. Also, on the back cover of your bulletin are our activities for this coming week. Um, I hope you'll be, plan to attend as much as you can. And then also, it's a great way to invite friends and neighbors to join us and to be a part of what we've got going here. I need to call on Jerry for an announcement, please. I just want to make a, a brief announcement on behalf of the Building and Grounds Committee, a brief report, and a thank you to all those who participated yesterday in our annual spring cleanup day. We had approximately 39 people, including a number of youth as young as three months, <laughs> participating yesterday. Um, a lot was accomplished. Uh, Fortunately, the winds abated. We had a lot of work that was being done outside, so a lot was accomplished. And in the words of Patrick Cummings, with a bucket and sponge in his hands, he said, our church has many doors. <laughs> Truly a statement with a double meaning. So thanks again for supporting the mission of the Building and Grounds Committee. And I suppose that means I have to trim the sermon a bit. <laughs> Let us prepare our hearts for worship. There's a meditation at the beginning of our bulletin. Please rise and join me in our calling ourselves to worship. I'll give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. 
This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever.
Please pray with me. Gathering for worship today, we are like the crowd that lined the streets witnessing your entry into Jerusalem. Some of us gather here full of enthusiasm. Some of us gather wearied by what life has thrown at us. Some of us have come out of curiosity. Some of us out of habit. Some of us gather with great expectation. Some of us with no particular hopes. It is here, O oh God, that you meet us and greet us. And if we will allow, it is here that you surprise us with your love and your grace. So open our eyes and hearts and surprise us today with renewed joy, with the promise of hope, with the glimpse of your good plans for us. Through our worship, we join in the cry, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today is Palm Sunday. Today we come with the crowd to watch Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. But I'd be willing to bet that like the crowd, we're not completely ready. There are things on our mind that we bring with us to Jesus' procession that we would rather not have with us. We don't feel ready for Easter. And so this morning, let us join together in prayer of confession. Help us to leave the things behind that we don't want to take with into the city. Please join me. O oh, majestic God, who came in humility and riding on a donkey, we join the crowds of the ages shouting your praises. While our lips give you glory, our lives do not consistently reflect your greatness, and living faithfully is often beyond us. We hear of your salvation and grace, yet sin is still close and real, daily drawing us away from you. Have mercy upon us. Ride into our hearts with healing grace. Forgive the wrong of what we have done, what we have said, and who we have been. Hosanna in the highest. Lord, save us and help us live more faithful and useful lives in response to your gracious love.
Please hear the assurance of God's love and mercy. God is gracious and loving. Hear the good news of the gospel. Nothing in all of creation can separate us from the love of God through Christ Jesus. In Jesus Christ, all our sins are forgiven. Believing and trusting the good news, in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and set free to follow Jesus. Thanks be to God. What does scripture teach us about the nature of our God? There is but one only living and true God who is infinite in being and perfection, a most pure spirit, invisible, without body, parts, or passions, immutable, immense, eternal, incomprehensible, almighty, most wise, most holy, most free, most absolute, working all things according to the counsel of his own immutable and most righteous will for his own glory, most loving, gracious, merciful, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin, the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Young disciples, join me up front, please, with your fish baskets. 
fish banks. So if you have your fish bank, just put it in this basket. So when you have a job, do you think you like every part of that job? For instance, I know for a fact that Pastor Norm, even though he's a pastor, really doesn't like the hymn, Kumbaya. And when I'm playing the flute, I don't like the note D flat, and I really don't like the note high F sharp. And I bet even those really good trumpet players back there, if my band director's right, really don't like to use the third valve. So do you think there were parts of Jesus' job that he didn't like to do? I actually looked up in the Bible how many times he called himself a king, and he only does it once. That's pretty crazy, isn't it? Because he was around for a while, and he only calls himself king once. And it's on Palm Sunday when he's asking the uh, disciples to go get him a donkey. Now, this is not a donkey. This is a llama. But even though he had to call himself a king, he chose what kind of king he wanted to be. Because in Bible times, when you were the king going into a city of someone else, you had two choices. You could ride in on a horse, and that meant that you were going to war with them. Or you could ride in on a donkey, and that meant that you were coming in peace, and that you were a gracious king. And Jesus, even though he didn't want to be king, even though he didn't like calling himself king, he still chose to be a kind and merciful king. So in your lives, do you think there are times that you're going to have to do things that you don't like? Like clean your room, eat your vegetables, do your chores. I don't like those things either, but I still have to do them. And it gets harder when you get older, because suddenly you have to do things like listen to the hymn Kumbaya. But you can just know that even though you don't like to do them, you still do them, just like even when Jesus didn't want to do things, he had to do them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for these children and help guide them as they go through life in the things that they like to do and the things that they don't like to do. Let them make the right decisions even when they may seem difficult. Amen.
Let us pray. Lord God, this day we are reminded of how blessed we truly are, and we thank you. Today we celebrate your grace and compassion that you gave us the gift of life and to live amid the wonder of your creation that proclaims your glory. We thank you for our worship today, for the power of music, and your word that inspires us and draws us deeper into your presence and the hope of your purpose and promises fulfilled. Thank you for this privilege of prayer, and we ask for courage, for patience, for perseverance, and greater trust in you, especially as we see our world seriously off track and tremendous human suffering and loss. Please guide those entrusted with authority to lead towards serving to improve the lives of the vulnerable and the struggling. And may we each one bring our best to reflect your gracious light into the darkness of this world. We thank you for our families and friends, and may our homes be places of hope, healing, affirmation, and wellness, places of respite to strengthen and encourage us to serve. We thank you for this, our church family, and here may we be a blessing to each other and to the community around us. Holy God, as we move through Palm Sunday, help us to pause to consider your sacrifice for us and all that you endured on our behalf so that we may live meaningful lives that make a positive difference and prepare us to live eternally with you. We are your blessed and beloved children. Please help us grow into what that truly means. In the silence, we lift before your throne those in need, the suffering and struggling, the sick and injured, the disappointed, the wounded and broken. Hear our prayers, O oh, gracious one. We do thank you, Lord, for your grace, for sending Jesus to bring us life. We thank you, Lord, for being with us always, for hearing us as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Filled with excitement, all the happy throng, strangled and 
The first reading this morning is from Matthew chapter 21. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he said, he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he cured them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the amazing things that he did and heard the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they became angry. The second reading is also from Matthew chapter 27. Now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that innocent man, for today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what should I do with Jesus who is called the Messiah? All of them said, Let him be crucified. So he released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. We do thank you, Lord, for your word. We ask that you'd open your word to our understanding and our lives to your transforming truth. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts, be pleasing and acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and redeemer. Amen. The Gospel of Matthew was written primarily for Jewish readers, and so the main focus is on showing how Jesus filled the Old Testament promises and hope that God would send the Messiah, demonstrating that identity of Jesus. That's the message of Matthew, as it's gradually revealed by all that Jesus does and what he says by the reactions of the crowds and his disciples and critics. Back just before they began their journey to Jerusalem, Jesus asked the disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told them all about what they'd been hearing. Then Jesus asked his disciples, but who do you say that I am? And in Matthew 16, 16, 
Peter correctly identifies him. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus goes on to explain to his disciples that in Jerusalem, he would suffer and die and then be raised on the third day. And all along their journey toward Jerusalem, Jesus continued to reveal more about himself and his mission. The Matthew 21 passage is to help us, the reader, interpret and understand the events of the coming week, the passion story, and the meaning of Easter. The triumph and entry story begins with Jesus and his disciples as they're gathered in Bethany on the outskirts of Jerusalem. Jesus instructs two of his disciples to bring him an unridden colt, which seemingly is sort of a minor matter of transportation. So why do you suppose there's so much emphasis on the donkey? Well, it's because the details of Jesus entering Jerusalem on a donkey, these are described and foretold by the Old Testament prophets and makes the point in the events of Palm Sunday, Holy Week, and Easter, that they're all according to the will, the plan, and the saving purpose of God, and in fulfillment of the prediction found in Zechariah chapter 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion! Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem! Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble in riding a donkey on a colt, the foal of a donkey. On that day, the Lord our God will save them, for they are the flock of his people. The author of Matthew wants to make very certain and clear that just as getting that colt was all according to God's plan, so too all the other events of the Passion story are also on purpose and exactly as God planned, indicating that the crucifixion of Jesus was not just some random accidental thing. It wasn't a flash crowd that suddenly got caught up in the moment, but it's absolutely deliberate and exactly as God intended. It was all the working out of God's plan and good purpose all along, to love, to bless, to save, to heal, to show gracious mercy to lost sinners. Just as God loved, planned, promised, and fulfilled way back then, so too God is still at work and still accomplishing grace and good. And so that means we are precisely where and when God placed us for us to make a difference. Now, a man on a colt of a donkey is hardly what you'd expect as a power image of someone sent to transform the world. And yet, as we read, starting in verse 10, when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, who is this? The blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he cured them. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the amazing things he did and heard the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they became angry. The Matthew 27 reading actually occurs that later that same week. It comes after his betrayal, arrest, and trial before the Sanhedrin. And Jesus is now at the Praetorium at trial before Pilate, who's grappling to resolve some very important questions. Who is this Jesus? And what do I do about him? Now, Pilate acknowledges that Jesus has done nothing wrong. Pilate's wife sent him a note urging him with a word of note warning, verse 19. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with this innocent man, for today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. And despite wanting to heed his wife's warning about her bad dream, Pilate buckles and bends under the pressure from the crowd. 
though he's well aware that the religious leaders are just trying to manipulate him. Verse 18, for he realized it was out of jealousy that they had handed him over. Pilate was warned, but he was afraid to stand firm with integrity. So instead, he goes along with the crowd and surrenders to his fear. Therefore, he's remembered for all time for condemning and crucifying a man he knew to be righteous and innocent, thereby earning his place in the Apostles' Creed in the line suffered under Pontius Pilate. And then, rather than Pilate taking responsibility for himself, he tries to punt and have the crowd make the decision for him, starting verse 15. Now, at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At the time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. So after they gathered, Pilate said to them, Who do you want me to release to you? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who was called the Messiah? Now, that should have been an obvious slam dunk, easy decision. But instead, the crowd chooses this notorious criminal. Verse 20. Now the chief priests and elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and have Jesus killed. When the crowd calls for Barabbas to be released, Pilate asks the most important question of all time in verse 22. Pilate said to them, Then what should I do with Jesus who is called the Messiah? All of them said, let him be crucified. This crowd choosing between Jesus and Barabbas has a fascinating connection to the Old Testament. Back in Leviticus 16, it describes when they had bring two goats to be presented at the tabernacle, and one of the goats was killed as a sin offering on the Day of Atonement, while the other goat was released alive to go out into the desert wilderness. Do you see that connection? It was foreshadowing this coming passion. But Matthew's purpose was far more than just telling about ancient history. Jesus didn't just ride in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. He still rides into my life and into your life today. It's really not Jesus on trial at Praetorium. We are. The writer is asking us, the readers, a critical question. What will we do with Jesus who is called the Messiah? Pilate illustrates the darker side of us that seeks popular approval by going along with the crowd and seeking an easy compromise with the world. Just as it was for Pilate and the crown that day, so too for us there's two critical questions that confront us all. Who is Jesus? And what should I do about Jesus? At various points, we all have to decide. We make our choice. We choose how we're going to respond to Jesus Christ, either go along with the crown or follow Jesus in truth. It's a call for us to focus on our faith as a response to God's prior grace. It's not that you or I went out seeking the Lord or that we work to earn and deserve God's grace, but rather having experienced God's love, blessings, and mercy, well, I want to respond, I want to grow closer and obey, and I want to enjoy this God who loves me who went out looking for me and found me even before I knew I was lost. It is God's will and purpose to bless us. And the Lord has so arranged it for our relationship with God to give us joy, meaning, and peace in this life, which is what happens when we use our gifts, our time, and our lives to glorify God by serving as the Lord shows us need. So that whatever it is that God wants, whatever God intends and desires, certainly that's what we want and desire. So if Matthew's gospel is truth, 
then we want to respond to its truth so that we either follow Jesus or we let him be crucified. Everything leads to this final question in the Matthew Gospel. Who is Jesus and what should I do about it? Every committed, faithful, and growing Christian I've ever known can tell stories about risky decisions they had to make. In answer to Pilate's question, who is Jesus and what should I do about it? And the way we answer will determine our character. What sort of person we're going to be. Selfish and always looking out for number one. Or self-giving, following the way of Christ the Lord. And the way we answer will influence how we deal with this world, whether we're part of the solution, helping to restrain evil and injustice as a light in this world, or contributing to this world's problems. It all depends upon what we do about Jesus Christ on our response, for it's about God's relentless love and continuing call to grace. So our call and task for today and for every day we live is to be like the shouting followers at the triumphant entry, announcing the glorious coming King that Jesus is Lord, and to not be like that crowd shouting, let him be crucified. Knowing the truth is not the same as doing the truth. So when and where have I ever stood firm for Jesus Christ despite possible cost, despite probable risk? Today, for us, for each of us, as we're moving into Holy Week, as we're confronted by the terrible, the blood and the cruelty, the inhumane suffering and death that Jesus endured, let that serve to remind us of the horror of sin and depravity and why we need a Savior, why God's grace accomplishes what we cannot. We are, each one of us, God's beloved children, precious to our King, called and equipped to bring that good news out to all the world and to let that love of God shine through us by how we live. So who is Jesus and what does he want from me? That answer has the power to change our lives forever. The critical question is this. What to do about Jesus Christ? Isaac Watts answered that question in a wonderful hymn in 1707. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my riches gain, I count but loss, and pour contempt on all my pride. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Let us pray. Holy God, your love and grace are unfathomable and so powerful. We ask, Lord, that we would hear your presence in a new way, a powerful, transforming way, that we might truly have a wonderful week preparing for Easter. Bless and be with us. Help us use these lives well. Lead us, O oh Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us stand and join in our closing hymn, 269.
And now may the love, the grace, and the mercy of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest and abide with you now and forevermore. Amen.